All right, welcome to our session on building an internal enterprise education streaming solution. My name is Chris Knowlton. I'll be your moderator today. We have uh, a lot of activity, a lot of things to go through here. Uh, and what I'll do is start off with uh, some introductions. Well, I'll actually let the panel introduce themselves. And we'll have some slides later. And I'll ask a bunch of questions. And uh, we'll see where we go. And then what we'd like to do is make this an interactive session as well. So if you have questions as we're going, please feel free to raise your hand. Someone will either bring you a mic or I'll repeat the question as needed. And uh, we'll see how far we get and what, what ground we can cover. So let's start with our panelists. I'll start here at this end, and we'll go across and let folks introduce themselves real quickly so you know who they are and where they're from, and go from there. I'm uh, Eric Hards. I am a manager of our digital media and visual communications for our space systems division at Lockheed Martin, which is really hard to get on a business card, but um, <laughs> that's, that's what I do. Um, I am responsible for uh, our webcasting for our space systems division, but have also been responsible for the enterprise. Um, and the architecture of the current webcasting system that we're using um, from Sonic Foundry's media site. And my name is Kay Gary. I work at Raytheon in Dallas, Texas. I've been in the webcasting space now for about 15 years within the enterprise. And I facilitate and manage um, our, our video library there. And I help with the customer service end and the user GUI interface. I'm uh, Andy Howard, and uh, I'm the managing director of a consulting company called, cleverly called Howard & Associates. Um, and I help uh, companies implement video communication, so uh, video streaming and video conferencing, and oftentimes the combination of, of both of those. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work with some uh, really progressive uh, clients like Deloitte Consulting, uh, Aetna, Anthem, Pella Windows, NYU. So uh, typically, from a streaming perspective, uh, the implementations I help uh, the customers with are for large-scale uh, large webcasting type applications. Hi, my name is Jonathan Schwartz. I'm a digital video manager for the USC Seoul Price School of Public Policy. I've been in corporate video now for about 10 years. Previously, I was at Celebrity Cruises. I was in charge of their IP TV delivery systems on board cruise ships. And now I work for USC. Uh, basically, my department straddles uh, two responsibilities equally. One is uh, online learning and every kind of streaming that involves with the online learning space. And then another is um, video production space, where basically we have to do live event seminar web capture, um, as well as making pro uh, promotional videos and marketing campaigns to help the USC brand uh, through digital video. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Well, what I'm going to do first is actually ask each of these folks to tell us a little bit about some of the major scenarios that they work with. And then we'll dive into one or two of those and get into them at a more architectural level so you get a better sense of how they built those solutions out. So we have effectively two representatives from enterprises, one from education, and Andy, who sits in the middle and sort of helps both when, with his consulting practice. So we have a, some broad experience here to look at and some different architectures that we can look at, some that are similar and some that are going to be quite different. So I think what we'll start with then, um, Eric, we'll start with you. Describe a couple of scenarios. If you want, I can bring up the first slide. Yeah, that'd be good. That okay. way I can at least stay on target. Yeah, hang on. So start there. That's you. And go to this slide. So I won't bore you by reading all of this. but um, And these are probably very similar to any of you who are doing any kind of live webcasting work or on-demand work within a, a corporation. Um, we cover the gamut. We do everything from, from large executive level webcasting with multi-camera, switching, audio control, multiple microphones, along with full AV in the room. So there's speakers and projectors and, and so on. Um, we also cover um, what we call some hybrid type events where we might have um, an audio uh, telecon with shared slides in addition to a VTC and wrapping that all up into a single webcast. Um, usually because uh, the the audience is much larger than, say, a, a VTC audience or even an audio telecon audience. Um, and we'll combine those and bring in all the sources directly into our studio and then webcast those out uh, to a much larger audience and they're able to see and hear those presenters. Uh, and then we do the typical educational type training events well, with a single camera and a single presenter. Um, in that environment. And most of the work that I do now is, is for our space systems, but I've also done our webcasting for um, 
our, our CEO for Lockheed Martin. And that takes place in a very similar environment. It's an auditorium with several cameras and, and streaming. The uh, AV is handled by the local folks, and I cover the webcasting side. Um, there's actually a slide after this that might help a little bit. The wall, is it the wall slide that's next? Yeah. Yeah. So I just real quickly wanted to bring this concept up because um, I have been on both sides of the wall, um, and I call it the wall because um, it, it makes it very easy and clear for me to describe where my work lies. So I try and separate the production side, which is everything that is this side of the um, Ethernet connector on the wall, um, versus everything that's on the other side of the wall, which is the IT side. So I have been on both sides, but um, that's how I kind of like to talk about where the responsibilities lies within our corporation. I'm currently on the production side of the wall mostly, um, whereas previously I was on the IT side of the wall. Perfect, thank you. All right, okay, let's go and talk a little bit about what you do. Uh, very similar to um, Eric, we have divided our webcast into the five spaces that he kind of described. Um, when I first started this in 15 years ago, um, our biggest thing was the large CEO uh, webcast where he would stand in front of a group of people in an auditorium and you had to bring in a production team and an audio mixer and you had to be prepared for him to walk around the room and you had lighting and effects to do and you got a large online audience and it really tasked our internal network uh, in order to do that, but we, we struggled through that. And that was the biggest draws that we had. But now we see that it's kind of flipped over and the user-generated content is becoming king within our enterprise. Um, we still have the large CEO events quarterly. They don't draw nearly as many people as they used to for live. Um, most of the people choose to view that on demand. And we have gotten in a standardized practice, this is the best practice for you, of chopping up the larger videos. Um, I was just reading in the streaming media where a study said that uh, users usually hang on the stickiness of their content was somewhere between four and six minutes, which really isn't a lot of time to hook your leadership. So we have divided our content up into chapters, and our tool allows us to do that very easily, which is really great. But the user-generated content is what's coming through mostly. In our enterprise, we're doing about 300 events a year. That's a lot of material to consume. And then the user-generated stuff is about triple that amount, as the graph there on the left will show you. So that's a lot of content going out there, pushing to people and uh, trying to view it. So that's kind of our scenario. Do you want to go into the next one? No, let's, let's save, uh, go into the detail part after we okay. kind of do the high Perfect. level with everyone. So we'll jump next to Andy. All right. Yeah, so um, in terms of the applications that um, I typically am working on, it's um, very similar. Uh, the CEO broadcast, the town hall, whatever you want to call it, is really the driving application because it's really the most challenging thing for an organization to deliver effectively. And it's one you're uh, not allowed to fail on. Exactly. <laughs> it, well, the good thing is it gets budgeted. Uh, it gets a lot of attention and, and things uh, tend to happen. The bad thing is if th things go wrong, everybody knows it went wrong. and. Uh, you know, you're the one that, that uh, needs to fix it. So that's actually good for me because um, that's actually resulted in some, some clients uh, coming to find me in the past. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that is a big trend, I think, in the industry right now is the fact that um, people have, you know, a lot of large organizations have been doing these uh, broadcasts for, for many years. For example, Aetna started doing them in 1999 they have a homegrown Windows media solution, and really the driving factor that they needed to change that was they had to move to Windows Server 2012 and it no longer supported multicast. Um, additionally, there was a lot of, um, they have a lot of virtual desktops, which are very challenging to, to work with, with video. Uh, Windows media, again, had a solution for that, but there really hasn't been a, a new solution um, that's come along to, to really solve that problem. There's a variety of vendors that are working on, on solutions for that. Um, you know, another trend I see is uh, people kind of still distributing content over uh, satellite networks that now want to you know, bring that onto their IP network. Um, I've seen a couple clients uh, do that. And certainly, the, you know, being able to stream to mobile devices is a, is a huge uh, 
thing that's really, you know, even though the, the iPad's been around for, what, five years now, um, and people have been able to stream content on, on the internet very effectively, a lot of organizations still don't have that capability, um, in big part because it's Windows Media, <laughs> which doesn't play well on a, on a tablet. Um, so, you know, the, the trend is moving towards H.264 for the video delivery, in which case you can then hit all the, all the devices. All right, and Jonathan. So I guess I'm a little different than my colleagues up here because we are not as concerned with trying to reach the enterprise during, um, you know, through a closed circuit solution. We, because we're a university, we have uh, internet two and high bandwidth. So pretty much um, what we're focused on is making sure that the content is available and accessible to whoever wants to watch it. So currently at USC, you know, we kind of use video in the online learning space. You know, which is a whole different animal than what we're talking about up here. Um, we do have a couple lecture capture rooms that use MediaSite for the for that purpose. But for the most part, you know, we're using it more and more in the marketing, recruitment, promotion video, which is pure production, and also in event capture, which involves you know web, uh, web streaming, you know, with or without live web streaming. Um, you know, of course, we have the mass events. We have commencement once a year. We, you know, we have a big, you know, three-camera multi-shoot. We have a tricaster set up. We're doing, you know, a large stream out through CDN. But pretty much all of our content goes through um, a typical uh, CDN, and we go out that way. What I think we're seeing, which is challenging for us, is that, you know, we're seeing a, um, a need to have streaming and video conferencing uh, integration happen anywhere in the university, regardless of the infrastructure set to do so, regardless if you have a hard room set to do that or whatever. So we're focused on building solutions that can be portable um, and mobile and kind of go wherever we need uh, to, go, to, go, to go do that. So a lot of our solutions involve having basically a mobile capture kit. I don't know if that slide is on there. Um, I don't think so. Uh, the second, maybe the, the big diagram one. It's all right. Um, yeah, so basically, you know, we, we have a mobile solution capture kit that involves creating, um, you know, having multi-camera shoot go into basically a software switcher, you know, like a wirecast or a tricast, something like that, and basically building the solution to be mobile. And then we depend on basically our CDN to get out to everyone because we're not as concerned. We're looking at maybe multicasting in the future to say bandwidth internally to the server, but for us with bandwidth not being an issue, we're just trying to focus on the mobility of our solution and be able to do that all wherever we need to do. Cool. Well, that sounds like that cues us up pretty well to go into a deeper discussion. Let's actually go, since we're on yours and, and you brought up your slides, let's, let's come back down this way. We'll start with you and go into the next slide, and you can talk a little bit about, you have two slides on here of different architectural levels, and sure. you can talk us through one or both of those. Okay. Um, I guess we'll start with the, the larger one. Uh, larger okay, actually, one. that's fine. So this is, okay. this is tip that... So this is more typical for the asynchronous users, you know, typical workflow, you just have a camera, you, know, you record something asynchronously, you put through Avid or Premiere, take your pick, you mix it down, you upload it to YouTube, Vimeo, you know, pretty standard offline production value. Um, because we don't have a lot of rooms out there with MediaSite, this is kind of what we do for the lecture event seminar capture that does not need to be web stream. We put PowerPoints in offline and, you know, pretty basic old school production workflow. The next one is pretty much, I think, what's near to this crowd, which is kind of the live streaming and making everything HD mastering capable, which is what I, what I call. So uh, basically, you, know, you have as many cameras as you need on the left-hand side there. You're going through uh, an input capture card uh, device. We're using the Aja IO 4K device. Um, we're using SDI across the board just because it's obviously easier. Throw it into a software switcher, usually we're using primarily Wirecast on a Mac Mini or a Mac Pro, depending on what we need. For large events like commencement, we'll flip over, we'll rent a TriCaster, but for the most part, we're, we're that. And this way, we can feed overflow rooms with iMag using a TV projector. Um, and then, of course, we output to a, a CDN, which is Ustream. And then, when, if we're happy to live stream as is, Ustream, as you guys know, can push right to YouTube and can put it right from the channel. But the main thing about the solution, which we're excited about, is we actually use the Wirecast and um, and or TriCast to record to disk. So after the event's over, we have an instant switched master in high def ProRes or DNX HD, and then we can instantly edit that and then get a quick edit up there quickly if we need to make lower thirds or you know branding or wrapping, something more extensive than the live thing offers. And then building on what Kay said earlier, you know, a big thing that we find being educational um, is that the attention span is not very large. So if we have an hour and a half lecture by an expert who you know is really good at what he does but not very engaging, we've had trouble trying to mon trying to get that content out there. So everything we edit, uh, everything we shoot rather, we drill down to a three-minute highlight reel, and we edit that highlight reel with some, you know the key salient points. We put that up 
right after the, right after the uh, event. Uh, that was a request from editing, but that way we get everything up there very quickly, and that has increased our viewership by over 400% by getting that highlight reel uh, down to like three minutes. That's pretty impressive. I guess it also speaks to just how we, we tend to look at things in these sort of bite-sized pieces yeah. now. And I think that's basically what we do. I mean, like I okay. said, we're more, we don't have bandwidth capacities in, large, in, in at USC, so going out to CDN is fine for us. That works well for us. Okay, great. All right, Andy, let's talk to the uh, sample scenario you provided. Yeah, sure. So um, when I work with my clients, I tend to tell them that, you know, kind of the way that the industry went was the, the enterprise providers in the space tended to build their entire solution. So you'd have the encoder, the management software, the delivery servers all tight, tightly wound together. Uh, my recommendation now is to, to break up the different pieces and use the best of, best of breed products for each of those pieces. So, you know, the video sources really, uh, like you were saying, can come from anywhere. It's, in a lot of cases, it's video conference rooms. Um, it can be a single camera shoot. It can be a three camera shoot. Um, a lot of people are moving now. They've got Skype for business implementations. They want to use that as an input into their streaming solution. So really, the, you know, the, from the video source perspective, that, that can be from anywhere. And what the way that we usually architect it is to, to bring that content from wherever it's generated back to a central production facility where it can then be produced, encoded, and then distributed out onto the network. So uh, for example, in Aetna's case, they would have, very similar to Eric's environment, they had the high-end production. So, uh, for example, if the CEO went into the into an auditorium and gave the, the town hall meeting, they would have a three-camera shoot. That would go into their high-end production facility, um, which is like a million-dollar facility that they have there. Um, and then, but then it would go into encoders and be managed through the through the management system and distributed out onto the network um, via multicast. If they were going to do a smaller event, for example, just a departmental meeting, a lot of cases they would, they would book a video conference room. They would do a video conference from one location back to the smaller production studio that they, that they had where they had a TriCaster. Um, they would produce that. But they could do some pretty nifty things with that. Back into the encoders, same exact distribution piece going out, outbound. Um, so. And then, you know, in terms of the, the management software, that needs to be able to, con you know, manage out all the different pieces of it, but most importantly, be able to deliver the content on the network. And then from, you know, the delivery perspective, as the industry moves more towards adaptive bitrate streaming, it's all HTTP, uh, my typical recommendation is to just use standard caches because then, um, you know, they're, they're transparently deployed. They, they can work with any solution. And then that allows you to, as you know, new technology comes out, um, new things are available, you can, you can you know, replace any of the different pieces along the way rather than having to do a forklift uh, change. And when you're using those transparent caches, does that also give you the added benefit of offloading a lot of your other web traffic on those same caches? Or do you separate into a separate video cache? It, in many cases, it does. In a lot of cases, they only wanted to do it for so video. It's dedicated, they, so they have, okay. Yeah. And in some cases, that's just because otherwise they'd have to get a whole other group involved <laughs> right. uh, in the solution. In fact, um, you know, some of the providers like Riverbed, for example, a, if a customer goes to Riverbed and says, I just need caching capabilities, then they say, well, but there's all this other stuff you can do. Right. And then uh, the person that wants just the caching is like, no, let's not, we just want the caching piece of uh -huh. it. <laughs> okay. So sometimes it can complicate it a little bit, but, but uh, you know, in general, it's, it's very, uh, very mature and very straightforward. OK, good, thanks. All right, and Eric, we'll go on to yours. You're skipping, oh, sorry, Chris? Just, sorry, no, I'm skipping K. Thank you. K, we'll go on to Although yours. Although it may be very similar. <laughs> Uh, so again, at the front, this is what our configuration looks like. Um, uh, you have your input devices, which can be VTC, it can be a camera. Uh, I think maybe about 80% of what we do is actually screen scrapes, uh, whether we run a PowerPoint file or whether we share a meeting with the presenter and add audio to it, which is our simplest um, setup, which is great. Um, so that can go into our encoders. Um, we've used three different kinds. We're pretty much settling on our vendor-supplied uh, QCS, uh, 
Kumu Capture Studio is what we use most of, but we also have used Digital Rapids and Digital Rapids, excuse me, and TriCaster. Um, we use them externally to our product and to produce those. They go into our Origin server, which happens to be down there in Garland, Texas, and then out to our Edge servers across uh, the U.S. and even over into uh, Europe. We have some over there. Uh, the stream from the Origin servers to the edges is all unicast, keeps the bandwidth down, makes the traffic flow higher. We try to keep Q Q QoS on them to prioritize the traffic, particularly the video and the larger ones that we do. And then from the Edge servers, they go out multicast to the users within that site. And then below that is our little diagram of all the um, setup for our product. We have an application server. We have load balancers in front of those. We have um, a hook in for the enterprise into it is the database, a simplified sign-on, um, our security issues there, so it has to hook in and work with all of that. So to me, that looks like a very complicated system, but our IT department makes it really look pretty easy um, and configurations on it. Great, thank you. I'll mention that all of these slides are gonna be available. I, I don't know if they've been posted on the site yet, but they will be posted on the site where you go and look in the schedule, you'll be able to see underneath the schedule, you should see a uh, link to these slides eventually, if not Chris, already Chris, before there. you go on, can I add, I'm sorry, I, yep. I left off, there was something I wanted to add, again, as a best practice. Um, when we do our video, we try to keep it around 700 kilobits and about 15 frames per second. When we're doing the audio and slides that I had mentioned is the most popular that we do, we knock it down to 215 kilobits and about seven frames per second. And how is quality on that? It's great. Is it pretty good? <laughs> yeah, okay, it's what good. we standardize on. It, yeah. it gives you a compromise. We bumped it up a little bit and found that the quality didn't really increase for what you were costing in your bandwidth. Okay. So that was what works out good for us. Right. Okay, great, thanks. All right, now Eric. Just curiosity, what size video are you? Is it 720 or? Yes. Okay. So I think Kay just described the system we're going to have. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're currently using Sonic Foundry's product, uh, MediaSite, in their enterprise um, environment. And, and the system that you see up here is very similar to what we have um, currently, but I thought it might be better to take a look at where we're going to be headed as far as um, the product we've, we've recently moved to, which is Kumu. Um, the, the real difference between the system you see up here and our current system is the number of servers and the edge devices. So we're moving away from multicast. Um, currently, we, so we stream the majority of our work that's live in multicast um, because we can. Um, we have a multicast-enabled network, and we've had it for several years, but Microsoft decided not to continue that. So um, we have gone to what most people are going to, which is either some kind of peer-to-peer, -peer, or in our case, we're using the edge devices. Um, same concept, we're unicast directly out to the edge devices, and then it'll be multicast to there if the network supports the multicast. Um, you'll also see on the diagram here that we have direct connection for single sign-on. Um, we have a transcoding server, which also does um, a text uh, to uh, metadata automatically out of the PowerPoint slide so that it's searchable. Um, and then uh, we, we currently, although the system, the current system supports mobile devices, it's not uh, an easy thing to do. Um, we can webcast live to multiple devices and, and multiple desktops, but in order to support m the multicast in addition to the H.264, which is needed for the iOS devices, we have to actually have two encoders running at the same time during the live event. Um, we can't send a single stream to the server and let it do the transcoding um, in the current system that we have. So another reason why we're moving to the Kumu so that we can um, do that multi-stream capability. Uh, all of our mobile devices have been standardized within Lockheed Martin to the iOS, we use iPhone and iPads internally, but we are dabbling in some other devices. It will probably not be Android um, for security reasons, um, but we will support the, some other like Windows devices on the mobile side as well. 
So did I understand that you were going to do end up doing some transcoding, at least as, in terms of going to an adaptive bitrate on the servers, on the, on the streaming servers? Yeah, for the on-demand work, actually. Okay. So and the, then the transcoding server that's off, hanging off at the left, what, what happens to the content that goes there and gets transcoded? It'll go back to the on-demand servers. So it's kind okay. of an automated process. Essentially, if a live event is done and we need it in, multi, in additional multiple bit rates or mm -hmm. we need to support additional devices on on-demand, okay. then it'll get, as part of the workflow, automatically transcoded and then put back on the on-demand servers. Okay, very good. Thank you all for that. All right, well, next question, I guess, then, is... Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, please, please do. It's actually built into Sonic Foundry's product, so it will actually scrape the text that's on the PowerPoint charts, and the reason that it can do that a uh, little different than Kumu's environment, Sonic Foundry does high resolution captures of the screens that are being ingested in the encoder. So they separate out the presentation between video only and slides or separate JPEG files. So it's then able to go in and read the actual text, or not read the text, but, but OCR essentially, mm -hmm. the text that's on those slides and then add it to the metadata for searching. Any other questions before we go on? All right, so I guess the next question is, given that you're all trying to get to mobile, but realizing that there are some constraints as far as devices and things, are you all trying to get to or reach everyone within your organization, that, you know, your viewer base, as it were? Or have you made a conscious decision not to, to get to everyone? And, and if so, you know, how, how are you doing it if, if the answer is yes? And, and how did you decide not to reach everyone if you're not? So Eric, we'll start with you and go from there. I was just going to say yes. OK, that's easy. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, <laughs> we we have had continual requests to do a webcast, entire corporation, anyone can watch, and we've continually had to say no, um, not necessarily because the system can't handle it, but because our network is not capable. Even with multicast, we still have pockets within the corporation that are unicast, and the slides that I mentioned, the high-resolution JPEG images, are delivered unicast as well. Um, they're bursts, but if you deliver a slide to 100,000 people, that's a lot of bandwidth. So um, we've been, uh, we've had to curtail the number of connections that we, we've been able to do on a webcast. Um, interestingly enough, when we do uh, sometimes get folks that are willing to test what our network is capable of, um, and understanding that they may have issues with the webcast, um, even when we, we try and do a webcast to say uh, one of our business areas that is you know, 30 or 40,000 employees, we're still in the neighborhood of about three or 4,000 viewers, which is um, about right for what we're seeing across the corporation. Um, we usually take the invited audience and we divide it in half um, automatically because people can't connect or they're not online during that portion. We take another 50% and we cut that in half because those people are just not interested. They're not going to watch regardless. Um, so that leaves us roughly about 25% of the invited audience that's capable of or wanting to even watch the webcast. Um, but uh, in addition to that, we were originally a BlackBerry house, so we weren't even going to bother delivering to them. Uh, and then we've only recently switched to iOS devices and um, the Sonic Foundry system um, like I said, is capable of delivering to them, but in a live environment, we have to set up additional encoders. So it's, it's kind of, um, we're in the mode right now where how important is it and how much money are you willing to spend? And then we'll try and get to that audience that you want. The new system, the one that we looked at up here, however, the goal of that system was to build in a 50,000 employee capability within the corporation delivering to simultaneous devices. So we should have that capability first quarter. Hitting any device? Hitting any, de well, not Android. Not going to do Android. Okay. It's not going to happen. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, um, at Raytheon, it's something as a service provider that we're looking at doing and trying to provide, and we're working close with the mobile apps team on what that's going to look like and the management around it. But it isn't something that we're trying to do right now. It's just not feasible within our environment. Um, the same considerations that Eric just mentioned, you know, what does that kind of bandwidth look like? What kind of cost ramifications are it? Um, and I was listening to a lecture this morning, um, and he mentioned something I hadn't really considered myself that I, I found to be very true. The time of day that you webcast might depend on how your audience is trying to consume that on what device. Um, if they're at work, which is what most of our stuff has done, um, almost all of it is during lunch periods, Tuesday through Thursdays, Monday and Fridays tend to 
uh, tend to drop off. At that time, people are at their desk. They're in front of their computers. There's no reason for them to pull out their mobile device. And in some of our areas, it won't even work well uh, with the Wi-Fi considerations and things going on. So most of our users are going to be on their desktop. So it's something that you know we're looking at. We're trying to move forward to it. We're trying to be prepared for it, but we're not in a hurry. Question we, in the back. Sorry. I just wanted to add, can, can we also assume that not every Raytheon employee has a mobile device? Is that correct? Not a company-provided mobile device. Do you have a bring-your-own-device? Not yet. Okay. So not yeah. yet. Same thing within Lockheed. We uh, not everyone has one, um, right. and it's a it's it's a percentage of the overall population. All right. Question in the back row. Oh, thanks, Justin. So yeah, Mark Christensen here from Biostream down in Australia. I'm uh, just wondering how you survey and get get to um, figure out who those people are and what device they're using. That's a big big thing for us. No, you're right. Um, so here at Raytheon, we depend a lot on, uh, again, the mobile app department. They supply us with um, numbers of how many people have what kind of devices, and they're using them. So we have to coordinate in partnership with them. Yeah, I would say the same thing. Internally, we have a pretty good connection with our not only the mobile app development team, but also the folks who are responsible for provisioning of the actual iPhones and the iPads themselves. So we have a good concept of how many are out there. Um, Currently, because we're not doing enough webcasts to those devices, I don't have an actual good number of what my actual viewing population is. All right. Andy, what are you seeing in the organizations that you're helping? Yeah, I, to answer the, the original question, I, everybody that I work with wants to be able to reach everybody. I mean, that's part of the why they're investing in the solution is to, to get everybody on the same page to be able to deliver these communications to all the employees. I think the most challenging piece of it tends to be the very small offices that might have between one and ten people and are still, you know, maybe have a T1 because you don't, obviously don't have a lot of bandwidth going into those offices. But what I try to recommend is don't, don't do the lowest common denominator thing, right? Because you've got a couple offices that only have T1s. Don't stream everything at 300K. Um, I typically say you should have a low and a high multicast. So the high multicast... Um, that we did at Aetna was uh, 1.8 megabits per second, 720p, which the network people thought I was out of my mind when I first recommended that. But I said, listen, you've got multicast end to end. You've been doing it for years. It's not even going to touch the network if you know it, it, the network's provisioned perfectly well. And what that also allows you to do is having the 720p is that with the production um, with the TriCaster that they use, they can have the video and the content, they can flip back and forth, but it all is just one video stream. So at the end of the day, when you record it, you've got one video file. It's much easier to manage rather than uh, having to have video synchronized PowerPoint slides and things like that. You can also do desktop sharing. It makes it a lot easier to do that. Um, and then, you know, so from an on-demand perspective, um, I typically say, you know, you want three profiles, a high, mid, and a low. Um, and that, in an enterprise environment, that's usually enough to, to get the, you know, the highest quality because there's not as much variability as there are, is on the internet. I had one client that was doing like 15 profiles for adaptive bitrate, and I, that didn't make a lot of sense. And you know, when you go to three, it's if you're on a if you're on a LAN, you're going to get the highest bitrate. You know, if you're at maybe one of those remote offices, you're going to get a lower bitrate, but um, you still have a good experience. So we're, we're a little different, and probably the, I'm probably the weird one here. Uh, our school, our department at USC, I mean, while USC is massive, my department at USC is only somewhere between three and 500 people. So, and half of those are probably staff who are, are not interested in what we're streaming because you know, we're, we're a research institution, right? So our goal is really not to serve the internal population, but to serve the worldwide population of people interested in public policy and, and, and public administration. So while our internal usage might be really low, we would have you know, like our more successful webcast, we have thousands of people outside the enterprise who are trying to access that stuff. So that we're in that little weird mid-range where we're not, we are, we don't really need to reach everyone internally, but we do want to reach everyone externally. So for us, that's why a simple CDN is useful for us. Believe it or not, we actually, I mean, 
to tell you how much bandwidth we actually have, we have a gigabit network jacks at USC. I could stream 4K if I wanted to probably, or 1080p even more, but believe it or not, we only stream at 720p two MIPS because that, you know, at most, we find that most people's browsers, even if we're streaming higher, can't decode more than 720p at, at the desktop level or, or even less at the device level. So we stream at 720p two MIPS. Um, and we go through CDN and we set up multiple bit rate, multiple bit rate profiles in the, after the during the live broadcast and post live broadcast. So that way people, no matter what device they can do, they can accept it. So if they're, you know, Ustream does allow that automatically. So on a mobile phone, take your pick, you know, Android, iOS, whatever, you can stream no problem on a mobile phone. Um, and then when we, when we put to YouTube, obviously YouTube gives you all your profiles there, so you're good to go. So we're pretty easy. However, when we record uh, during the live stream, we'll record at, you know, really high res, 1080p. We're actually thinking about going to 4K, so that way we have the full HD master to play around with, to do those highlight reels I talked about earlier, and have fun with the content later, and re-monetize it, repurpose it, use it for future things marketing campaigns, promotional videos, that kind of stuff. So we're a little different animal in, in that respect. Um, you know, I mean, I mean we've, we tried doing a 1080p test stream, and you know, we actually got more complaints when we streamed at 1080p than we did 720p, because people would, the browser detected the internet connection in burst mode, could say, oh, I can handle a 1080p stream, and then it would just sputter and downward. So we just like, okay, no, no, no. We're going to make max out 720p, so even if, you're, even if your internet provider at home has burst speed, you're not going to get more than the two MIPS at 720. So we actually have tons of, we have more bandwidth than we can do in the outputs and the receiving, and that's a problem. All right. And, but yeah, I think you've all answered the question that I had next, which what quality level are you shooting for? It sounds like you're all shooting, even though with different bit rates, for about 720p with decent quality. Yeah, I didn't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, because now I feel bad. And it's like, um, we're, we're delivering 320. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. It's, um, and, and that has been driven by our, by our network environment. And a lot of it has to do with, with just how concerned they are with whether or not it's going to become a problem across our network. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've proven with multicast that we can deliver higher uh, sizes and higher bit rates. But you know, a lot of it has to do with the content we're delivering. In general, it's talking heads, and we just haven't had the need to go to a larger video size because of that. Right. So it's it's a you know you kick it back and forth. You've got the folks that say, you know, hey, I can get 720p or 1080p or even 4K delivered to my computer at home or my TV at home. Why can't I get it at work? And I say, yeah, but you're not watching a feature film. Right. You're watching a talking head, and you're probably really more interested in listening than you are actually seeing them. Regardless, so we actually don't have that many people who want that higher resolution and the network folks are very happy about it. Okay. Oh, Chris, can I, one more thing? Probably one thing and also helpful for us is that because we go through a CN, we solve all the problem of where we don't really care when they watch it. So for us, we go straight to the on-demand format. So as soon as we're done, we're on, uh, you, our CN just loops it. And we, or we'll put it on iTunes Juice so they can actually download something like that. So our solution also entails having the post downloadable and looping features. They can pop in whenever they want. Okay. We're not we're not really care you know, we don't care when they watch it, just that they watch it at some point. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Any other comments on quality? All right. Um, so when you think about it, and you've touched I'm, I'm gonna preface this by saying you've already some of you've already touched on this one as well, but um, when you think about the best possible ways to distribute your live streams Obviously, there's multicast, there's unicast uh, using uh, internal origin edge network or, or caching servers. Uh, there's also peer-to-peer. -peer. A lot of folks are not happy about putting that on an enterprise network, but there's increasing sort of resurgence of peer-to-peer -peer technologies which are available um, today to solve the multicast issue now that, that Microsoft has pretty much gotten out of that business. So I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts of each of you, just even if you've brought it up before, just sort of summarize what your thoughts are on those different forms of delivering in which you think works best given the parameters that you have to work with. Jonathan, let's start with you. Right, I'll be a little quicker because we're not doing that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, exactly. Honestly, um, like I said, we're all external, so it's a little different for us. However, I can speak a little bit about what we're planning on doing in the future. So USC is a very in 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 interesting infrastructure in the sense that the web services, like whenever you go to a USC web page, all that's cached by our central IT division. So. One thing we'll be experimenting with come next year for our larger broadcast is putting an internal server, probably like a Wirecast, uh, you know, RTM, RTSP server, or, or, you know, stream server internally, and send that to our, you know, and then have the web page embed that. Which, so therefore, our web page is serving out the embedded stream. So by default, they're caching it for us. So it'll be kind of like a unicast connection from our internal server to our web service division, Central USC, and then people will watch it that way. So we're just kind of that's something we're considering, but. 
uh, like I said, I'm quick. We're not really, you know, <laughs> we're all external, so we're, we're just using the right. CDN for the most part. Right. Okay. Andy, what are you seeing? Yeah, so obviously I'm a huge proponent of multicast, especially in, in very large environments. I don't, there's really no other way to support a webcast with 20,000 concurrent uh, viewers on an enterprise network. Um, there are solutions that are coming onto, onto the market um, to be able to multicast H.264. Uh, ramps, uh, you know, can multicast HLS now. Their um, media uh, platform and VBRIC both do flash multicast. So there are um, solutions that are, that are out there that are, are uh, supporting that. And it hasn't been easy. It's still a little bit, it's not as easy as how Microsoft uh, made it, but um, it's starting to get there. So I wouldn't uh, hesitate, you know, going down that road. Um, in terms of on-demand content, um, like I said, uh, uh, with HTTP streaming, uh, utilizing you know HTTP caches just makes um, makes the environment so much easier to manage because you don't have to manage it. You know, a lot of times people used to you know pre-position content and they'd spend a lot of time creating all these rules, and uh, with caching, it just takes care of itself, so you don't have to to worry about, but it still allows you to have that high quality. And because of the usage patterns for on-demand, it's much less of a, of a challenge um, because, you know, pe one person's watching it now, one person's watching it later versus, you know, that burst of everybody watching a, a large-scale live event. Now, that being said, for, uh, I did a project for Keurig, which is, you know, the coffee machine company. Mm -hmm. They had They've grown by acquisition, so they had a lot of different networks um, scattered throughout the world. They were, you know, had four or five different WAN providers. They couldn't get multicast working on their WAN, but they only had, you know, a few hundred users in each different location. So, for, for that particular client, we said, let's forget about the multicast because it's going to get be too challenging to get it going on on the WAN. Just do unicast. So. They just stream, you know, one stream unicast to the locations, and then uh, once it gets on the land, there's enough bandwidth to support the, the amount of users that they have there. Okay. Yeah, I think I outlined uh, we're currently pushing uh, unicast out to our edge servers and then multicast from there. We are trying to look for a solution because of the multicast dilemma. We have been talking to Ramp about their solution and looking at that. Um, for mobile devices, we've been looking at the H.264, but again, you know, we're not ready to go very far with the mobile devices yet, but I think that's the way we're looking. Um, HTML5 is, is going to be a big factor, I think, too, for us in our environment. Okay. So, yeah, Great. currently multicast, um, Windows multicast, and I'm still somewhat hopeful that they're going to solve some of that um, <laughs> and maybe come out with a, a different form of multicast, but when you we'll say see. When who do you mean? Microsoft. <laughs> I'm, I got my fingers crossed. We'll see. Let's talk afterwards. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> or, or Wowza. Yeah, or Wowza. We have, we have multicast. Um, so, <laughs> I, and I'm, I'm also interested in what, um, you know, the H.264 multicast is going to be capable of, but... Right. Um, we're setting up Kumu in the same environment that you have, which is unicast out to the edge devices and then multicast out to the users um, because we do have the multicast network. And, and I would agree with Andy that I don't think I could. It'll be interesting to see what happens when we start delivering some unicast streams off of Kumu as well because without multicast, I don't think I could deliver to 50,000 employees at, at any given time given the network that I currently have. Mm -hmm. um, and I was going to say something else, and I forgot what it was. <laughs> It'll come um, back. Yeah, so <laughs> that's where we are. Okay. Well, let's let's change the look, I guess, uh, change sort of the perspective a bit, and think about what's happening now, and where you see things going as far as trends, and things that are going to impact how your deployments evolve over the next, you know, year or two or three. So, if each of you could share a couple. Two or three trends, key trends that you're seeing, I think that would be great. I know, um, Jonathan, I think you, you actually sent some in. Do you want me to put them on the slide? No, that's what I got here. Okay. okay. Why don't we start with you and, and we'll. Sure. Talk so, about those key um, trends you're seeing. we're noticing three key trends. They're kind of interrelated, but we're noticing first and foremost that, um, like I said earlier, we need, we need to do streaming and video conferencing anywhere. Even if the room is not set up with a traditional distance learning environment and multi cameras and a media site or you know cameras mount the wall, whatever, we need to do it anywhere. So we're starting to 
you know, Dean's conference room, you know, <laughs> place across the street, you know, whatever. So we're starting to build solutions that are more mobile, um, like a mobile cart with a capture card and, go, you know, software-based switcher where we can do, I mean, obviously you're not going to be able to do a four-camera, you know, multi four-camera multi-camera shoot in like a conference room, but, you know, we need to be able to stream um, a video conference anywhere. And, and, vi and the video conferencing, and that can mean, you know, Adobe Connect, it can mean Skype, it can mean WebEx, but, you know, be able to do that anywhere. Um, Second trend we're seeing is integrating, uh, specifically, maybe more specifically for education, but integrating the distance learning student into the campus culture environment via streaming. So basically, a distance student, you know, is from you know anywhere in the world, and there's an, a you know a very known lecturer coming to talk, and they don't have access to it because they're not on the ground student. So we need to be able to we're starting to scale up where we can quickly capture those events and seminars and stream them out to some student or capture it asynchronously and get to them quickly. But you know we want we're trying to we're getting the pushback to make sure that distance student has access to all the great seminars and lectures on campus wherever they may be held. Um, and then finally, and I think this is going to be our big pain point moving forward, is we're seeing the big push for synchronicity, uh, synchronicity where you know a distance student. Um, or a remote viewer can integrate and talk back with the presenter, ask questions, you know, uh, chime in, you know, have a chat line, whatever. So one thing we're going to be doing moving forward is how to pick on uh, pick a more versatile video conferencing solution. Obviously, probably being a software based, uh, more than likely than not, or a combination of software hardware, and then integrating that into our live event via uh, the web stream through some kind of source. I mean, obviously, our solution now can take it as an input, but how do we manage that? You know, is there someone there managing the chat line? Is there, you know, a Skype control center somewhere else? You know, how do we integrate that? But we're we're getting a big pushback to do synchronicity to make sure that the whoever it is, wherever they can, they can chime in. All right, thanks, Andy. Yeah. So I mean. We, you know, we talked a lot about the networking thing. Oh. <laughs> talked a lot about uh, you know the networking challenges and and uh, mobile devices. So those are obviously trends I think we're going to see moving forward. I think one of the things that I I tend to see is that you know it, while it might start with the executive broadcast, once organizations start doing these these live events, then it starts to go down the next level of management the next level of management. So kind of like that slide that Eric had where there's all these different types of events. That's just going to generate more and more content out there. So um, it's going to be more and more challenging to manage all that content. So you really need to, to look at the management software and, and you know, make sure that it's going to allow you to do what you want to do. I think some of the uh, unique things people are doing with speech to text now is, is very cool because it allows you to search within the video, not just, you know, do a search and the video shows up, but then you can jump right to the point in the video with your search term. Um, so those kind of things of being able to categorize uh, categorize the information, um, even some of the social features like being able to rank it and things like that so the, the good stuff rises to the top is going to be very important. All right, thanks. Kay? Uh, I can echo that. As you were talking about that, we're very excited about our new implementa implementation of Kumu because it will help us do that, where we can search words spoken in the video. So I think that is going to be a big thing. Uh, one of the things I already mentioned that we're seeing is that uh, shorter clips are better the more you can break them up. Most of our content is user-generated, so our ability to enable employees to create their own content at their desktop and upload it into our system library and uh, create the metadata around it so people can find it is becoming a very big trend within our department so that people can self-educate themselves is a big deal. Um, being able to integrate that with the social media that we have internally. Uh, we have our own wikis, we have our own blogs, and their ability to embed that video in there and start a conversation around it is another way to socialize um, that video and attract viewers to it and get them talking about it themselves so that that's the less marketing that we have to do from the top down. They're doing it themselves. So enabling them to capture that video and put it out there easily is becoming really, really important. So everything they said, no. A <laughs> um, couple of things. Uh, if you were at uh, Corey's keynote um, yesterday with Microsoft, one of the things that he said was that you know video is just a better way to communicate and therefore you're going to see its continual growth which I completely agree with and, and I expect to see. Um, I think another trend that, that you've just solidified for me is that we're going to see more user-generated content internally. That has always been a big battle um, 
between legal and HR and our communications folks and how much we're going to allow um, employees to generate their own content. And I think that that's actually going to be coming to a head probably next year, at least within Lockheed Martin. And, and that's going to have to be solved. It's the same problem we have with our, our cell phones and, and our phone cameras. When cell phones had cameras, so our security folks said, I'm sorry, you can't bring those on campus. So you can imagine how long that lasted. Um, so now we have iPhones which are capable of capturing 4K video and, and posting it to YouTube. And so why can't I post that directly to my internal network and actually share some information? I think that's something else that's going to have to get solved within our organization. And then the other big trend that I'm seeing is more external type communications, more of the ad hoc social network, Google Plus. Um, types of connections that they want to be able to make because an event is happening internally and that is actually very difficult for us to do. Either we have to say, well, we'll, we'll use our cell connection because it's external to the network and you have to use your personal device in order to do it or you have to start poking holes in firewalls and they don't like that very much. So I think that's another thing that we're going to have to figure out internally as an enterprise is how can we, how can we use these devices which people have um, effectively and also securely um, and also start connecting more to the external environment and sharing more of the things that happen um, within and outside of Lockheed Martin. All right, thank you very much. Um, let's talk, I guess, Maybe I did this in the, in the wrong order, but that was sort of where you see things heading. I'm actually going to ask you to look back a little bit again now. Just given what you've been doing as far as your deployments and sort of adjusting to the times, what are the biggest uh, or you know, one or two lessons learned or best practices that you think you can share with this group that might actually help them with their deployments? Can I have one other part of that question? Sure. Did you come from the video? Was video already being used, and so it was a natural progression of they said, hey, we want to use this more, or did someone have to sell executives on, hey, that should be in video, and then how has that grown within your respective organizations? Does that make sense? Which, which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> was video already kind of being used, or did someone have to come and sell video? That's a really interesting question. Um, the way that we started webcasting was... Um, we actually set up a computer and we hooked a camera to it and we used Microsoft Windows Media and wow, we could actually see a video. Um, we showed that to our CIO and he said, can I, web can I talk to people this way? And we said, sure, why not? Um, and then his peers saw it and they said, well, I got to have one of those. So um, it was you know, this kind of internal growth that happened through that process and at the time, I was working for our, our IT organization and, and we could actually sell it as a product. So we did production and we did webcasting and, and essentially it was this internal backwoods growth that happened via webcasting. And it was just kind of natural because communications was via email. There, there w we weren't videotaping our executives giving messages unless it was the you know, end of year kind of thing. So there wasn't a lot of communications happening via video. Webcasting actually started that process. Does that answer your question? At least from our perspective? <laughs> yeah, we had a, a similar experience where um, video has always been a part of the life. Um, mostly it was used externally for marketing. And then they found out they could use it internally to market various things. And then suddenly uh, it was an ideal of one of the producers there that, hey, maybe we could stream this out live so that we could get our, you know, again, it started with the CEO messaging going out, and then others, you know, tacked onto it and decided they could do it, and we expanded it into the knowledge learning. Um, as a best practice, I would suggest when you get ready to do an event that you create a checklist. Um, I, I heard this before in one of our sessions, and I'll echo it. It seems very basic, but it's easy to skip a, a very important step particularly under a panic or stress situation. If you don't have it written down and you check it off, um, I don't know how many times, uh, very few, I have very few experience, um, but I've gone back and, and something really simple as you know, starting the encoder before I try to reach it externally with my application will hang me up and I can't figure out what's going on and you get down to that last minute and then it's just like, oh my gosh, have a checklist. Put a checklist out there. Um, another good thing um, I find from my customer's standpoint, most of them are very understanding and a lot of them are pretty tech savvy. If you set their expectations and if you help them stay updated and keep them apprised of what's going on, they'll be more likely to work with you rather than condemn you 
which is, is really hard at the time. Everybody's under stress. But it, it's really helpful when you go backwards. And if, if you have established a good relationship with them, then they're less likely to turn around and condemn the technology based on their experience because you've already set them up and explained to them what's happening, what the hiccups are, the complications coming up. So establish that relationship and set yourself up with a checklist so that you don't forget anything. Two of my ideas. Uh, yeah, most of the companies, especially the larger companies I've worked for, have been doing it for a while now. They're just trying to do it better now and to reach uh, more people on more devices, just more effectively with better quality. Uh, I find me small and medium-sized businesses maybe haven't used video as much just because maybe they're not as geographically dispersed, things like that. But um, you know, even those companies are now starting to understand the value of, of, of video, so they have kind of a... Uh, clean slate that they that they can start with, um, and you know I think it it the culture of the organization will kind of determine how prevalent it, it is used. So you know you're typically going to see an organization that does a lot of video conferencing is probably also going to do a lot of streaming and and vice versa. People don't use a lot of video conferencing; they're probably not going to use the, the streaming quite as much. So I'll start with building on that. Um, it's you know the culture organization. So to answer your question first, we start off with a <laughs> really, when I came on board, we had a really basic YouTube channel. The videos were all standard deaf with horrible audio. <laughs> and then the university said, oh, you know, we're gonna make everyone promote, push, promote one video, or upload one video per week. And the school's like, well, we can't do that. So that's, what, that's how they hired me. And we start off, I start off with a standard deaf YouTube channel and mandate, put up one video per week. You know, that was, that was based on it. And where we grew from that was people saying, realizing slowly, the culture organization, oh, we can really push our brand this way. We can really promote ourselves this way. And and I kind of position our department since that, you know, hey, look, I understand you have this mandate of one video per week on YouTube, but why are you spending $43,000 outside the university to hire someone to do your promotion video? Let's bring that out in house. So for us, it was a cost savings mechanism as well. We start off with a, you know, idea we want, the school want to promote themselves a video, but we also want to, you know, try to save these cost savings. And we've saved the school quite a bit of money by bringing everything in house. Um, so that's where we started, if that answers your question there. Um, I think lessons learned for us, uh, we learned a couple. <laughs> First and foremost, um, and this I know this sounds really basic, but um, like I heard um, you were saying you, you broadcast a 360p. I don't think your video quality is as important as your audio. That's one thing we learned. If your audio quality is good, people will handle bad quality or compressed video or you know, postage size stamp. Really invest in making sure your audio is good in your production end. That's the best advice I give on the production end. Um, uh, uh, another thing we noticed, we learned was that um, understanding what your organization is going to throw at you. So when we start, when I first said, you know what, now that we've built this promotion video in-house, we have all this equipment, we can now do the things, let's start web streaming internally. Let's start doing live streaming internally, right? They said, okay, great. Um, go to this event. It'll be a one camera shoot, one person talking. Great. So I show up with a really basic device. Like, oh, can you um, have an audience camera and can you have a PowerPoint feed dump and can you do this? And you're like, ah. So I think you have to understand what your organization is going to throw at you. <laughs> so that way you walk in with a solution that can handle everything they might possibly throw at you and then know when to say, you know what, after you get past this point, you need to have the budget to go beyond that. So basically we've grown now to the point with our solution that we can handle pretty much anything they'll throw at us until they get to three or more cameras or something high profile like commencement, in which case, or, or, or like we have, you know, um, a high profile name like John McCain or Arnold Schwarzenegger come to this, which case, you know, I'm sorry, we're gonna run a TriCaster. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna go for that extra level. So understand what your organization's gonna throw at you. And um, the other two things, the other lessons I think we learned was um, uh, track your, have analytics at the very get-go, because nothing will convince your organization more that you are valuable if you can show we had engagement and we had people viewing our brand. Because when I can show, hey, look, that web stream we just did, yeah, you spent three grand on it, but we reached 4,000 people. They're like, whoa, what, really? You know, and even like a couple hundred, they're like, really? A couple hundred, because remember, you know, we're a policy school, so even a couple hundred in our industry is like, that's huge, you know? So analytics are very helpful. Um, and lastly, building the point that you guys said earlier about trends, um, <laughs> We got bit, we're being bit very hard the fact that we didn't start with ADA and ADA compliance and transcription from the very beginning. We now have a library of YouTube of 678 videos representing somewhere around 1,000 hours of content. 
and now I'm getting requests, hey, can we search it, you, you know, do this teach, uh, can we search that, can a professor find a clip when so-and-so has said this and use that in their class? Um, and that's where we're getting bit at now. So now I have $100,000 proposal on my desk from 3Play um, you know, to basically go back and retranscribe all of our videos and make it searchable with a little Java app, kind of like what Temple does. I know Chris in the audience, Temple does that right now for their online learning. And my organization's like, $100,000 to go back and retranscribe? Is our content really that valuable? And then the, and then the debate is, well, what's valuable, what's not? So I think that's what, you know, lessons we learned. Great, thank you. Are there any? I'd like to just echo the audio thing. Oh, don't, okay. don't skimp on the audio. That's <laughs> extremely important. Any other final comments from the panelists? All right, any final questions from the audience? One over here, sir. Go ahead. Oh, microphone. Hi. So, uh, Arpad Kun, Ustream. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. This was awesome insight. For me, that was the greatest panel uh, on this conference. Oh, thank you. Honest. Yeah. So, seriously, I'm, I'm very glad. Put that on your survey form, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm going to fill out this. Okay. <laughs> so, um, content delivery is my responsibility and my passion. And I really hate, also, I also really hate choppy video and, and spinning wheel and all, the, all those things. Sure. And I have spent my last five years with this problem, and, and uh, we at Ustream came up with a solution, with the eCDN, Enterprise CDN solution. Mm -hmm. And I invite you to a pre, so it's a beta test, invite only beta test. We are just before launch, and we are, I'm, I would happy to help out, to, to test, to, to see, just to, for fee of charge, to, to look at your uh, uh, opinion, to, to, no, so, so you look at it, you tell, my to t you tell me my opinion about this. I'm very excited about that because I think this is very important that multicast is, is a problem. It's going to somewhere which is not maybe forward. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we really want to solve this because for video, as, as you mentioned, is, is the future of, of communication. So uh, I want to invite you to, 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 to test Great. it. And, and does that get apply your to, does your invitation to, to beta test your new ECDN, does that apply to anyone in the room? Uh, if, yeah, should, actually, they, should they come see you? Yeah, yeah please come, okay. come and see me. Uh, All right, but great. Just, so yeah, anyone, please come Thank and see Thank you. Me. All right, timing-wise, we need to wrap it up. I think if you have further questions, our panelists will hang around for a few minutes, come up and see them. Thank you all very much for coming, and thank our panelists for sharing their insights.